Morning, everybody. Nice to see you bright and early. Um, my name's Julia Bird, and what you're about to see is a very short extract of um, a show with Daljit Nagra that I have produced that's been on tour um, over the last six months or so. Before I start, I'd like to say thank you very much to Writer Centre Norwich and the British Council for the invitation uh, to Daljit and myself, and also to the Arts Council, who fund this sort of work uh, for us. So I want you to imagine the full set of Daljit's show, uh, which is a whited out 1970s style um, domestic living room. Uh, Daljit sits in a big armchair, there's a piece of furniture with some flowers, there's a big screen behind him. As Daljit reads and recites and performs um, extracts from the Ramayana, he dashes around the stage, uh, there is um, sound effects of lightning and tigers roaring and battle spears and explosions, um, there's little bits of, sort of music interludes, um, there is a gorgeous golden, orange, green, forest-like lighting that comes in at various parts of his tale, um, and then every now and again, uh, projected cartoon images of the characters from the tale will um, pop up and Daljit will interact with them. So uh, there's a little screen there and there's a big screen behind him. Um, you're just going to have to work hard to imagine that. Um, Daljit is the only poet that I've worked with twice. Um, I've worked with lots of poets. And it's not that I don't love all of them that I've worked with uh, in the shows that I've produced, but, but Daljit's work lends itself so beautifully to um, the live literature stage that when uh, his publication with Faber, the Ramayana Retold, came out, I thought, yes, I'm going to have that. I'm going to make that into a show. I'm going to take it on tour. Um, he's going to tell you a little bit more about the Ramayana and what it means to him, but I, I think you'll see um, why he was an irresistible choice for me. So thank you. Hey, hello everybody. Thank you for that lovely introduction as well, Julia. Um, I, I came across a story as a child of the Ramayana um, through my grandparents who told me an oral version, which is based um, on their kind of Punjabi version. And my version is based on the many different Indian versions of the story, and they do vary a bit from region to region. And then um, a Thai version, Malaysian, Burmese, Laos version. So I, I tried to find as many different versions that I could get hold of um, to help me write my own kind of interpretation of the story. So try and write a global story, as it were, a multicultural thing. Um, OK, so I'm just going to read a few sections to give you a sense of the story. I've been orchestrated by Julia. She told me exactly which sections to read. It's great. Um, so in this, in this section, so there's a, there's a demon, and he's, he's become really powerful. The gods can't destroy him. So Vishnu has to be born on Earth as Rama, because um, he, as, a human, as a human, he, he has the power to kill a, um, this, this Ravana guy um, uh, with the help of monkeys. But at this point, he's, he's, he's born as Rama. He's a teenager. He's going through a desert. And he's being tested, but he doesn't know he's being tested. So he's with his brother, Lakshmana, and a sage. Okay, so I'll read that section. It's called Kill That Mother. It's a bad mother. So all the sections are a bridge for the show. Okay, so perfect drought everywhere, horizoned in a desert. Heat, licking heat, in a death lust, where only is growing death. Deep in the desert and somehow unfazed, as if this were not miracle enough, a mere boy wearing a divine blue demeanour was steadfast walking, nippy walker, whose feet were barely touching the ground, for the speed of his crossing too was unnaturally composed. So, who was this warrior-looking walker? Rama, of course, Rama! The mighty boy, already with lithe but supernaturally powered limbs. Rama was being followed by his brother Lakshmana. And a bit behind was sage Viswamitra. They were north of Ayodhya, in the sun's anvil. A sun that slumped its deadening weight on stone and rock, turning rock and stone into fine-spun sand. The sage explained this was the sole way to the sacrificial grounds, adding... Here was once a jolly people's zone with gardens and grounds like bazaars, bright with fruits. But a demon family, a family of Raksasi, lived here once, who turned the region into a desert. Only their mother, Tadaka, remains. Rama and Lakshmana looked about nervously as the sage sniffed the air. Tadaka pierces anything alive with her spiky trident. Not even here will you hear the shrill beetle or any tweeting sweetie bird. All being spiked. 
Taraka Rome se still. My vow of non-violence means you must step up. The sage stood Lakshmana back with him, for it was clear Rama was being tested. Rama pleaded, where is she? Before the sage answered the question, the question was being answered by a rackety storm ploughing towards the sage and the boys. What formed through the ploughing before Rama was a normal-sized woman, but with eyes gobbing fire, with fangs dribbling molten. All of it hung on an old mama, bereft of her boys and her husband. Good grief. Rama knew mum was not the warrior word, and hardened as recipient of this fiend's three-pronged spear, which came at shrill speed for his brows and arrived with an eye shot, just in time for Rama's nimble-fingered stringing of his massive bow, so his arrow flew just in time to shatter her spear. The shattered spiky shards flew up and rained, and gaining speed, rained sharply down into the mum, stabbing her in her tender flesh parts. Tadaka was dead. Spectating overhead the gaggle of ebullient gods made life move fast forward across a once desolate region. They made flowers plurp into dandy lives of purples and tangs, shaded by newly sprung panassa, palm and mango trees. The gods chimed into the sage's inner voice. Grant this fine-handed boy the deepest know-how. He may be the saviour. Over the coming seasons, upon his willing wunderkind, the sage delivered the subtlest A to Z techniques, so both Rama and Lakshmana mastered the art of defence and, if necessary, attack. Rama perfected the hardest mantras that once recited, allow you to ignore those gobby rogues, hunger, and her dry bow, thirst. Rama was fast becoming awesome. He could shoot an arrow exact through 90 palm trees to pierce a juicy apple and could shift a hill or heave ho an irksome cliff. But he had to master restraint, for the sage advised against causing a stink on nature's blossom harmony. When the boys were really skilled, it became a cinch, a doddle, sending back each astro weapon to its celestial shelf. The sage then loaded Rama with weapons for the journey. Trooping through the air, out of nothing, were brand new weapons of shiniest divine gold paraded before Rama, as if to say, Lord, we are yours to command. Okay. So that's the end of that section. There have been a whole, whole set of images flashing up, and I just sort of sat there, read quietly and calmly. <laughs> or fairly quietly. But. Okay, so I'm going to read the next section as well. Um, this is where the sage is going to make a sacrifice. So he's going to make this massive sacrifice to the gods and hopefully clear the region of demons. Um, and when I was growing up, you know, grew up near Southall, and we used to visit relatives in Hamwell in Birmingham, and those sort of Indian areas. We used to walk past those sort of Indian shops, and they had, you know, paintings, these supposed portraits and whatever, and posters of, you know, the, the, the white, brown or blue gods, whether they be cows, um, bears, monkeys, or humans, but you never saw an image of a demon, uh, which is why I took some liberties in this and some other sections of how I presented my demons. Um, on the screen, at one point, there would be this gigantic splattering of a gonad, which Julia, you'll see why when we get to it. And it's the audience response is usually amazing. I just sort of half look up. Um, it's disgusting, isn't it? That, yeah. Anyway. Okay, so now from the highest mountain peak in Siddhasrama, said the sage, we have been travelling across the great heights for only a dozen sunsets or so it seems, but many seasons have elapsed, and how well you have fought for insight in yoga, philosophy, and the ways of demon destruction. Here is where we will perform the great sacrifice. We must toil to attain our vision's purpose. The sage went high-low preparing, and the brothers brought cartloads of sages from near and far, who themselves had been busy propitiating the gods for this culminating battle. The rabble of Asura and Raksasi was running about in the sky, like feet tapping on the floorboards upstairs. Their pongy rain indicated to the brothers an attack on the sacrifice was getting dirty. The sages lit fire from a hundred plus trees and circled it with chorus prayers, so song and flame ascended with a pomegranate brightness. But what came down from above were distress cries 
from supposedly tortured children. Each trauma or sorrow was reconstructed by the demons and played aloud. Endless mimic voices, horror radio, psycho crash. The demons who lived in the lowest regions of the upper world were scuppering the sacrifice. The sages felt unduly boohooey at the next set of mimic whines from sisters, mothers, grandmothers supposedly under attack. Whose shadow is at my nape? Release my wrist, fiend! My son's will, my husband is coming. Haram me, haram zada. The demons were having a wild time. To further unsettle the prayers, they thrashed down batload stomachs, spleens, giblets, blood water, gore galore. A gonad fell in a sage's outstretched palm. Urine dribbled the beard of another. The delicacy of the story forbids further embellishments of this nature. <laughs> Safe to say, many an abattoir must have been ransacked and spilled at devious intervals. The battle was hotting up, so Rama made a solid promise. Belt out your prayers about this spiring fire. We will shelter you. Rama and Lakshmana fled to different mountain ranges and became pure arrow action, shooting thousands of spears at dizzying speed. So many arrows that held their ends in the sky in the curve of a spiky umbrella, shielding the sacrificial fire from being doused or spattered. So long as each multiple arrow round made a penumbra, the sacrifice stayed prayer happy. Somehow the sages were pulling off the sacrifice with the extreme focus imbrication of mind and body till each sage was a flame ball burning evil from earth. Now that the region was freed from demons, in the place of eruptions were wide-ranging rainbows because peace was advertising itself as promoted by the mountain-to-mountain-wide calling card of spangly colours. Rama, Lakshmana and the sages saw flying through the rainbows but couldn't help but wave at the birds, birds, birds. Even cheeky cuckoos. And normally we have a cuckoo sound at this point. <laughs> okay, so this is, um, two more sections. Two more. So, okay, Rama's made this big sacrifice. Um, he's, he's entitled to his rest in, in our version, and he goes to this place called Matilla, where he's about to meet the love of his life, who's Sita. Sita means furrow in Sanskrit, and Sita was found in a furrow by King Janaka, who regarded the whole thing as a miracle and raised Sita as his own daughter. Um, and I, a part of my research um, into Sita was about sort of toe rings. I, came, I went to Cambridge Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology and I looked at some sort of um, tradition Indian, traditional Indian cultures. And they had these loads of boxes of ten toe rings for, for, for individual women. And each, each of these sort of sets of toe rings were different style. Because apparently t the women would wear a toe ring for each different toe. Okay? And you pick a, sort of a toe ring to suit the personality, the look of that toe. So you conceivably wear 10 different toe rings. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> this is something to take back to your region, isn't it? <laughs> in fashion. Um, and I guess I, in, in my version, I, 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 was, I guess I was thinking of Sita as like those Bollywood actresses. And I was thinking of people like Hema Malini, when I, this woman I grew up with, uh, watching on, on, you know, on the screen. Um, all those actresses, they, they had lovely big cheeks, big shoulders, thick necks, and lovely happy tummies. You know, it was the ideal of a woman to me. You know, it was the ideal of an Indian woman and subsequently an ideal woman. So I tried to plump up my Sita in, probably not in this section, but other sections. <laughs> anyway, so he's about to meet this, his, his lover. So, fan your imagination on the Yodhya's lookalike, Matilla, with its towers, turrets, domes, all golden or pastel. Rama and Lakshmana fanning their gaze on swings strapped to trees, swaying with couples. And nearby, the girls wore a length of Kashoma cotton that whirled about the body and pointed to the S-type anklets and pointed to the bell-top toe ring on each toe, each toe ring specially designed to suit that toe's darling Mien. And speaking a while longer of toe rings, some girls wore the cheeky come-on rings that were double-bosomed and filled with a tinsy knocker, dingling its own tantalising tune. Hi, hi. What's more, all girls strode about wondrously barefooted, all rehearsed love tunes or danced to soft gom-goms. No wonder Rama and Lakshmana smiled to the music of their hooting, their panting. 
And there, whilst by the stream, Rama's eyes lifted upwards. And there, across on a balcony, from where the cool breeze blew off the balmy sea, a woman in shining corsium silk, with a spotted deer border, and with eyes brilliant as the lotus, and with her feet all of a sudden rooted, so she looked the double of the goddess Lakshmi. Rama's second take on, who is that? Is that the beauty of the world across on the balcony, observing the jamboree? And her eyes fell, according to the exact second of the cosmic dial that we call fate, on Rama's eyes, at the same time as Rama's had flown startled upon hers. Their heartbeats doubled on the same count and hearkened in a shared breath. The hearkening damsel was Sita. Whilst Rama dazed at her beauty, Sita dazed at his, and thought to herself, how this must be the veiled recognition that we call love at first sight. Together they had walked, eon after eon, fresh as bold new lovers, under the starry lanes in heaven, he as Vishnu and she as Lakshmi. When Rama disappeared from view, Sita felt a withering, for her heart had absorbed a love dart. Wounded by love, virgin love, she remained. The bangles on her wrists slumped downwards, and she was heard murmuring, emerald shoulders, blue sky beauty, who are you? Why have you invaded me, pinching my heart to leave me ashamed? I wish you stood before me now as a god. Only to you I feel I would freely speak my mind. And Rama, enough to say, he sensed his whole being being sacrificed to a girl with curly locks across her forehead. Rama wondered if she was married, but if she were, would he have felt such a fine dart of desire? On one whose bow was schooled in the art of demonology, on one whose bow depended demon death, now fondling his mind with a girl in flowing silks for armour, with a bow of sugarcane and flowers for arrows. How could she have so softly felled him? Rama smiled at the irony. Not the monkey scene. Do the wedding scene and then the monkey scene. We've got oh, I forgot. Oh, sorry. You have to. You have to ignore this. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll do. I'll do. The, I'll do the. I'll read. Okay. I'll read the wedding scene. So, um, I don't know what's going to tell you. So basically, so um, after this, Rama um, is, is is instructed um, by King Janaka, Sita's father, to lift up this gigantic bow. Uh, and Rama managed to lift it, and he's the first person to ever to lift this bow, and he shoots an arrow, the bow shatters, and it's, it's regarded as a great miracle, and Janaka says, you, you will marry my daughter. Okay, and the sage says, yeah, we're going to marry her. Tough luck whether you like it or not. Okay? Um, and I guess I was partly thinking about sort of, you know, the various different types of marriages. This is a certain type of marriage. Rama doesn't know who he's about to marry, okay? so he's going to go through the marriage scene. Okay, so basically, the, the people of... Um, from, Kasala, um, from Ayodhya, from North India, are going to come to this um, kingdom of Kasala for this marriage. Okay. And we normally have a bit of Bangra music and all sorts goes off. <laughs> Is there anything gaudier, more glorious or heartbreaking than a good old-fashioned wedding? The husband will henceforth be nourished by a wife, but the bridal parents must relinquish the breakfast hugs a daughter has daily blessed them, blessed upon them. A wedding is oh, sighs. A wedding is laughter. A wedding is footloose arms in the air, clamorous enjolliment. A wedding is Rama's father receiving a jolly invite from King Janaka for a bride and groom embarking on their belle vie. So kindly come with all your peoples to celebrate. On the sandy streets of Ayodhya, on the streets of Matilla, who is not hearing the elephant loud trumpeting? All you beauties, please be coming by and by to partying, party, party. Suddenly, the whole of Ayodhya on the, on the streets ready for the trek to the kingdom of Kasala. The gathering can be summarized by admiring the youth. When a boy fell off his horse and into a palanquin and into the arms of a honey-smelling lover, the lover didn't sting him with a slap. Instead, they spun themselves into laugh-aloud gupshup and would not need parting. Couples in a strop soon patched up, and dumbbell-armed lads stood by a river, 
offering to carry across their dreamboat, the dreamboat that sought no better transportation. All listened to proud talk about wondrous Rama, winning the most beautiful woman as proved by the ultimate praise that this Sita had thighs shapely as elephant trunks. <laughs> the two kings met, and in an instant, two powerful states were bonded. For marriage is not about two people, but about two tribes forging fellowship, couples commingling their communities so affection's commerce is forever being overlapped and broadened in the great flow of humanity at one. King Janaka held a round pearl on a gold leaf, the Chudamani. Then he placed it in Sita's hair above her forehead. The Chudamani was a crown serving the elect face. When Sita was alongside Rama, Janaka spoke. Here is my Sita. In giving Sita, I give my ground. Look at her, never tire of looking at her. Take her hand in your hand, and evermore she will walk alongside you, as your own shadow walks alongside you. On the marriage platform, Rama's heart-stopping moment, he observed for the first time his bride. He, who had lifted a godly bow, became woozy with fear and wonder. Would this be the beauty of the world that he had observed that day on her balcony? As he lifted the veil, to his great release, he saw once again the face that had completed his being, now complete his being once again, as he hoped it would forevermore. Okay, uh, sadly, it, it, it doesn't complete forevermore. And various things happen, and Rama ends up in a forest. Um, his wife gets abducted. Okay, she's been taken, and Rama then enlists the help of a bunch of monkeys. He comes across a monkey army. There's some bears along the way. There's going to be a few squirrels. Um, I, I, this is obviously the exciting bit because Julie get really, gets really excited with this section. We have loads of monkeys, all sorts of wild things on the screen um, going on. Um, and the monkeys do talk really intelligently. They have really kind of wise, interesting things to say in, in the various versions. Okay, so, I'm going, so at the end of this, I'm going to kind of, we're going to summon the army. I know it's early in the morning, but to help Rama win back his wife, um, we're going to kind of hoot wildly, beat our chests, and stamp our feet at the end. Is, is that okay? Uh, you, you, you'll get my cue. <clears throat> it's a good sort of wake-up, isn't it, as a, as a way of ending my session. So I'll, 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 I'll just sit and read this. The fighting season was at them. King Sagriva gave sober notice for a great army thus. Now all hear this. Go forth, my clarion-calling monkeys. Go forth, you who leap, and in leaping, sip the clouds. You who simply blot the sky at full span. You who are built like elephants and buffaloes. You, my boldest monkeys, leave no cave, mountain, or bunker in the ocean unchecked. Go forth, bringing bounding out the million, billion monkeys lapping the global mantle by plying them with standard inducements and gifts and telling them there is a king of the monkeys who calls them raging forth for celestial battle. Go, go hooting forth at once, my beloved okra couriers. Within ten days, monkeys spilled from forests, mountains, caves and seas. Three hundred million monkeys, mascara black, came from Mount Anjana. A thousand million who live on roots and fruits clamoured down from the Himalayas. One hundred million dazzling golden monkeys down from the sunset mountains. Millions rose up from pale-peaked Mount Mandara. Millions were tawny as a lion's mane and stirred from Mount Kalasa. Millions were fierce as Indra and came from Vandayas. Flanked and ranking leaders of armies from sun-charmed land upon land. Monkeys handsome from eating only berries. Monkeys who could fly across mountain ranges. Monkeys who could morph into bears and serpents. Monkeys who could swallow a fireball, spitting it back with missile might. Monkeys flashing tiger teeth and diamond nails with, that with tooth or nail alone could dizzy the foe. And all the uncategorized monkeys, all the monkeys never named or known, who would fight to the final limb. Through forest and thicket, the earth thickened where they amassed. They drank up the sun. They blotted the sun as a huge dust cloud 
blinkered the sky. The ground shook to the leaps and whoops, riddling the tottered world with apocalyptic din. <laughs> You're a good army. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you. <laughs> Smacked you up again. Oh.